It is easy to get um, somewhat blasé about a rocket factory if you're here every day. Uh, but it's true what you say. I mean, this really is a rocket factory, and you're walking around, and that's a rocket engine, and that's a stage that's going to go to orbit, and, and that's a, uh, a spacecraft that's going to carry uh, people to the space station, uh, you know, and one thing after another. And, and these are actually pretty remarkable things. But uh, you, I have to remind myself of that uh, from time to time because as I walk around, all I tend to see are, oh, we've got to fix that, we've got to improve this, we've got to change that design. Um, so uh, I have to sort of bring myself back, think about the, the big picture, and, and remind myself that this is actually pretty cool, unusual stuff. The reason I'm doing SpaceX is, is not uh, due to some childhood epiphany or because I think this is the uh, um, highest return on investment uh, way to spend money. Um, I think starting a rocket company is, is an unusual thing to do and, and, and pretty risky. But uh, I'm a big believer in, in us becoming a space-sparing civilization and ultimately extending life beyond Earth. Um, when I was in college, I, I try to think, what are the really big problems that face the world, that, that which will most affect the future of humanity? And <clears throat> the, the, the three that, that uh, I thought were the most important were the Internet, um, uh, transition to a sustainable energy economy, and... Uh, third was uh, space exploration, in, in particular, uh, becoming uh, ma making life multiplanetary. And I didn't really think I'd have anything to do with the third one because that seemed like the province of governments, uh, largely and or entirely. Um, and um, I, I didn't, wasn't sure how I could get involved in, in sustainable energy. Um, although that was the path that I originally started on, that's what originally brought me to Silicon Valley, uh, was to do a PhD at Stanford um, in uh, energy storage technologies for electric vehicles. I, I taught myself how to program computers when I was a kid um, and uh, um, bought my first computer when I was 10 and sold my first commercial program when I was 12. Not bad. Yeah. Made a lot of money for a little kid. So take me from that, that you were a programmer. And did you sit, now, I'm not real clear on uh, leading up to the PayPal. Did you program... Was it X2 or Profinity? I'm, maybe I don't have the story right, but how did that all come about? Led sure. To the big innovation of what we think of as PayPal. Data. Right, right. Um, well, I had a company before that, um, which was called Zip2, which uh, people wouldn't generally have heard of, uh, but it did things like maps and directions and uh, yellow pages, and it also did uh, you know, email, calendaring, personalization. But really, that software was... Um, provided to uh, the major media companies like the New York Times company, Hearst, Knight Ritter, to um, uh, power their websites and really have, have a, a much more functional uh, experience for the user. Um, so my first company was not a consumer company. Um, it was primarily uh, providing Internet software to media companies to enable them to go online. Um, and, uh, but, but then the second company, uh, PayPal, um, started off uh, originally as, as X.com, um, and uh, and then about a year after the, after I started the company, um, merged with another company called Confinity, um, and th both Confinity and X had started from very different places, or not, uh, kind of different. Um, X had started off as a financial services company. W w um, the idea was to um, aggregate all of your financial services seamlessly in one place, make it really easy to use, so you don't have to go to multiple uh, financial institutions to take care of your mortgage, your credit cards, your, your, your banking relationship, insurance, uh, mutual funds, all that. You could just go in one, one, lo one location. And we had a feature, which was the ability to email money to anyone in the system. Was yeah. that the real sort of big headline, the big innovative thing? Well, it was very easy to implement um, in the beginning. Um, the, it, it gets harder to implement over time as you, as you are forced to minimize the fraud in a system. But the initial implementation of, of email payments is very, it's really trivial. Um, uh, but anyway, we had that as a feature, and w whenever we demonstrate the system to people, um, they wouldn't get excited about the aggregation of financial services, but they got really uh, wowed by the fact that you could email money to somebody. Um, and we're like, wow, okay, that's the easy part. Um, so, but we started focusing on that, and, and uh, more and more, just let's, let's focus on the email payments uh, part of it. And, uh, uh, and then Confinity came at it also from a different uh, area. They started off as a Palm Pilot cryptography company, um, and then developed an application with that cryptography, which is to, to be able to beam money tokens via the infrared port of a Palm Pilot. So if you remember back in the day, Palm Pilots didn't have any connectivity, really. They were just, you know, but they had the infrared ports. So you could beam, like, little things back and forth. Um, so uh, you could beam money between Palm Pilots. Um, and then they also had a, a website 
which is called PayPal, where you'd reconcile, reconcile those payments. So you'd have your tokens in your Palm Pilot, you plug it into your, put it, put it into its dock, and then uh, you'd log on to the PayPal website, and then you'd, that's how the, the, the beamed money tokens would transfer. And then they added a feature, oh, well, let's just allow people to just use the website without using the Palm Pilot. Um, and so we sort of converged to the same business model. Um, and then in um, early 2000, uh, about a year after both companies were formed, um, and only a few months after we'd uh, launched our respective websites, uh, we, we merged the companies uh, or uh, with X.com acquiring Confinity. Um, and initially, the company was, was known as X.com, and then, um, but we used PayPal as the consumer brand. Um, and then about a year after the, uh, the merger, we changed the company's name from X.com to PayPal to match the, the name of the product. Just towards the end of my undergrad, uh, I, I was thinking that the Internet would be something that would really fundamentally change, change the world and, and change humanity forever in, in a very significant way. Um, it seemed to me like uh, humanity was um, uh, acquiring a nervous system. Um, and, uh, you know, previously you'd have people uh, that were sort of isolated cells, if you will, um, that, but, but the communication mechanisms were weak. Um, and, uh, and there was really no way that any one cell had access to all the information of the collective consciousness. Um, you know, you'd have to go to libraries here and there and talk to people and that sort of thing. And that's, but, but, but w the way it is today, um, if you, you could be in the you know, jungles of, of, of Congo um, and have a satellite link to the Internet and ac have access to essentially the, the entire knowledge of humanity. I mean, that's pretty intense. I mean, that's, that's a huge, huge difference. And what, what uh, made like you 94. Realize? 94. Yeah. Okay, and so that's so you started concentrating then on the Internet as the first of these three ideas. Yeah, so then in 95, I, mean, I was, I mean, actually, I'd been on the Internet for a few years before that because, you know, since I've been in the physics arena, you know, in the sciences, people were using the Internet uh, for many years. I mean, as early as, late, as early as the 70s, they were using the Internet. Um, but... Uh, it was very difficult to use. It was just text-based. You had to have. It was, it was very difficult to get access to it. Um, you had to be in the, uh, either in the government or, or in uh, some academic institution. Um, but once it became clear that the, that the internet was going to be widespread, that everyone would have access to it, uh, that's when it occurred to me that this is really going to fundamentally change humanity. Um, and that that became clear um, in around around about the '94 time frame. PayPal was not the first to do email payments. So you have to say, well. Why did, it, why did it succeed where others did not? Um, there was a company uh, that was acquired by Amazon, uh, started by Danny Shader. Um, I forget what it was called, but it was also an email payments company. There was an, a company called Billpoint that was acquired by eBay, uh, which did email payments. Um, so how is it that PayPal uh, was able to beat all of them? Um, and in, in, in particular, how was it able to beat Billpoint when Billpoint was eBay's in-house service? Um, so not very few people understand uh, why. Um, and it, 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 there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, if you, if you look at the underlying economics of the system, uh, we, did, uh, we've, we figured out a way to authenticate bank accounts. Um, so the normal way that um, uh, it, it's really hard to authenticate a, a bank account from the standpoint of pulling money from someone's bank account. Because you can give us a bank account number, but how do we know it's you, right? Um, the, the Federal Reserve has no authentication system um, that, that, that works for, for pulling money from people's accounts. Um, but we came up with, with an idea for authenticating it by making two small deposits um, in somebody's uh, bank account, which effectively made it a four-digit PIN. So only the person who had that bank account could, or could, could tell what the four-digit PIN was because of those two, two little tiny deposits. And that, The authentication process. That we figured out how to authenticate a bank account. Without, without anyone, without even seeing you. And that's like the breakthrough, right? That was one of the fundamental breakthroughs. There were many. Okay, well, um, just tell me one more. That was, that's pretty big right there. That's a very big one. Um, and the reason it's very big is because when, when you send money from one person to another, if you send it using a credit card, you, you have a very high fee associated with that. But if you send it using um, an electronic check, it only costs a few cents. Plus, the, the electronic check is very unlikely to be fraudulent, but whereas credit cards, there's a huge amount of fraud associated with credit cards. So with a, with a credit card system, you're paying, your effective cost, inclusive, including fraud, um, is probably about 3.5% of the transaction. Um, the, the effective cost um, of, of the electronic check is maybe 
a quarter of a percent. I think it's worth noting that um, when somebody has a breakthrough innovation, it is rarely one little thing. Very rarely is it one little thing. It's usually a whole bunch of things that are collectively uh, amount to a huge innovation. Um, but the problem is, because it's hard to convey a complicated thing to people, um, the innovator uh, or the innovator's PR department will say, oh, such and such is the reason why it's better. This little catchphrase, um, you know, like, like, or is it with eBay, like, uh, Pam wanted to, like, do Beanie Babies or something. Um, I mean, really, that's not the basis for eBay, but that was, like, the, the PR department. Yeah, the the Pez dispenser, that's right. I mean, like, yeah, that's not even a true story, is it? It's, even, it's, it's like something the PR department made up. Um, so, you're really, it's, uh, innovation is, is a, a collection of complex things that are difficult to usually, usually difficult to convey. So, it's, there's, some, there's some sound bite that's given. Um, you know, why is Southwest Airlines the most profitable airline in, in the whole business? It's not, because they just, it's not just because they use 737s. Okay, I mean, if that was, if it was that easy, everyone could do it. <laughs> I think generally people are too, the, the, the thinking process is too bound by um, convention or analogy to prior uh, experiences. So it's, very, it's rare that, that, that people try to think of something on a first principles basis. Um, they'll say, we'll do that because it's always been done that way. Um, or, or they'll not do it because, well, nobody's ever done that, so it must not be good. Um, but that's that's just a ridiculous way to think. I mean, you, you have to you have to build up the reasoning from the from the ground up, from first principles, as is, as as uh, is the phrase that's used in physics. So you look at the just look at the fundamentals, and um, construct your reasoning from that, and then see if you have a con conclusion that that works or doesn't work, and it may or may not be different from what people have done in the past. Um, it's it's harder to think that way, though. Sorry. Why is it so hard to think that way, and how how have you managed to? I mean, obviously you've thought the other way. I mean, how have you broken that pattern? Um, I don't know. I just always thought that way, I suppose. Um, I mean, I, I would always think, think about something and, um, and, and whether that, that thing was, was really true or not. And could something else be true? Or is, the, is, the, is there a better conclusion that one could draw that's more, more probable? Um, I, I don't know. I just I was doing that when I was in in um, elementary school, um, and I would just question question things. Uh, maybe it's sort of built in to, to question things. Well, let me go back to some nuts and bolts. You, PayPal. Tell me about it how would it infuriate built. my parents. By the way, I'm sorry. Say that again. It would infuriate my parents that you would think differently about things, or that I wouldn't just believe them when they said something, because I'd ask them why, and then and then I'd consider whether that response made sense given everything else I know. Now you have what five kids? Are any of them? Uh, Doing that back to you? Yes. Well, one of them in particular <laughs> does ask why a lot. He's master of the chained why. So that old thing about you know you're going to get get what you are to drive you nuts, right? Did they used to tell you that? We hope you get a kid just like you. Yeah. Um, well, you know, heritability of traits is much greater than I'd thought. I mean, I I, I was actually much more of the you know I, I I'd assumed that in the nature versus nurture it was much more nurture. But I, having had five kids, I think it's much more nature. Um, I mean, w w what are you? You're hardware and software, right? So the difference between one person and the next must either be a hardware difference or a software difference. Um, and w why are kids that may have the exact same background or same school, same everything, yet there's widely different uh, capabilities, yet they have the same uh, input experiences? Well, then it must be the hardware that's different. So I built up Zip2, the first company, uh, sold that to uh, Compaq um, for about $300 million. Um, and then uh, wanted to still do another company on the internet, and that's, that's where I thought, well, where, where is there still room for a lot of innovation on the internet? And that's, why I, that's how I chose the financial services sector, because money is just an entry in a database, and it's, it's low bandwidth. You don't need any big infrastructure upgrade on the internet to make it work. Um, and so it seemed like there must be room for innovation. And, and that's how I decided to do something in the financial services arena, even though I really had essentially almost no background in financial services, except for an internship at a bank. Um, and uh, anyway, so that then PayPal, PayPal went public. We sold PayPal to eBay for about a billion and a half. And then um, I wanted to do something different, something outside of the internet arena. I was a little burnt out on the internet, um, having been immersed in it and spending it, you know, every day of my life on it for, for a long time. Uh, and and that's where I, I, I thought, well, 
you know, I've got a bit of capital. Uh, let me see if I can do something in the, in the space arena. Um, and I initially started out with this idea of let me do a, a small philanthropic mission that will generate public interest. Um, and so I gathered some engineers from the space business and started to learn more and more about what it took to, to do space missions. And, and But the, uh, what I came to the conclusion that really the problem, the reason why we weren't making more advancements in space was not that there wasn't enough public will. I think there, there's actually plenty of public will for space exploration, particularly in the United States, which is a nation of explorers. And I, but I came to the conclusion that, that really there was a fundamental problem with, with space transportation. And if the space transportation costs hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars, then, and people don't think there's a way of doing it that doesn't bankrupt us, they're not going to want to do it. So we've got to figure out a way to do it that's affordable and, and workable and reliable. Um, and uh, that's, that's why I started SpaceX, is, is really to uh, try to make a, a, a huge difference, at least an order of magnitude or more difference in the cost of space transportation. And, and, and in, the, in the magnitude of, of the capability of space transportation, because we need very big rockets if we're going to, uh, um, you know, make life multiplanetary. Well, uh, definitely, the long-term vision is to help uh, make life multiplanetary. Um, so, really, these are all steps along the way to, to doing that. Um, so, we're starting off with a, we start off with a small rocket. It's capable of putting half-ton satellites into orbit. We're about to do our third launch, uh, which will carry a, a, an Air Force satellite and two small NASA satellites uh, in about a month. Um, and then we've got our big rocket under development, the Falcon 9, um, which will actually be uh, the most capable rocket in the world, um, or at least the Falcon 9 Heavy, which is a, a larger variant mm -hmm. of it with two side boosters, will be the most capable rocket in the world. Um, and and uh, we also have our Dragon spacecraft. And then a couple of years ago, we, we won the contract to design, build, and operate the successor to the space shuttle, which retires in 2010. So we will be uh, taking supplies to the space station, returning them to Earth, and then NASA has an option to uh, add um, manned capability to our system. Um, uh, you know, if, if, so to pay us to do to, to to transport astronauts as well, which we think they will they will exercise. Um, and we were actually designing the whole system uh, with people in mind from the beginning. Um, so it's really it's a relatively small difference from one to the next. And to, to most people, I mean, we come in here, we look at this, we're, we're thinking NASA. So compare the NASA approach to your approach at SpaceX. Some of the compare and contrast that a little for me, so we see the difference. Sure. Well, it's important to appreciate that the, the actual hardware construction um, is done by um, uh, semi-private companies. I mean, Boeing and Lockheed are the two biggest contractors to NASA. So when you see a, a rocket getting launched, that's either a Boeing or a Rocky, Lockheed rocket, typically. Um, N NASA does not build the rockets, uh, but NASA will contract with the big aerospace companies, the big, diff the big um, government contractors, to, to uh, uh, develop and build uh, these rockets. Um, and, um, and that's typically done in a cost-plus manner, uh, where you know, there's just a, a, a fixed fee, or, or there's, 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 a, there's a fee, uh, or, or a total contract value, and then Boeing and Lockheed will earn a fee that is a percentage of that contract value. And if that cost increases, then they earn more. So it's actually, it's not a very good incentive scheme because they're incented to make it more costly. Uh, and that's one of the problems that uh, plagues the cost of space exp exploration. Um, you know, one of the big differences we're aiming for here is full reusability. No one has ever developed a fully reusable orbital transportation system. Um, that will be a really, really big breakthrough if we can, if, if we can do it. Um, it's a very tough problem. Um, you, you know, uh, the Soviet Union tried to solve it. The United States government tried to solve it. Uh, and spent tens of billions of dollars collectively trying to do that and, and did not succeed. So it's a tough problem. We're, we're going to try to try to do it, though, um, with Falcon 9. Okay, so, so what, what's your plan if we go out two, four, six, eight years? Of what's going to happen, like, next year or the year after? What are the benchmarks you're trying to achieve here at SpaceX? Um, well, we um, are launching Falcon 1. We, we uh, are going to be launching Falcon 9 um, sometime next year. We expect it to have, have the rocket at Cape Canaveral around the end of the year and launch sometime next year. Um, and that'll uh, carry both uh, heavy satellites, satellites uh, of over 10 tons, to orbit, as well as uh, uh, transport our Dragon spacecraft, uh, deliver that to orbit so it can go to the space station and do resupply. So two years from now, we expect to have launched our big rocket and demonstrated um, resupply to the space station. Um, four years from now, we, I think we will demonstrate manned transport. 
Um, and uh, geez, six years from now, I think we'll have our heavy lift uh, launch vehicle operating. When are we going to Mars? Are you going to Mars? There's a lot of variability around that prediction. But is that sort of in the back of your mind somewhere? Like a yeah, absolutely. Tell me just a little bit about why you want to do that. Well, first of all, it's not that I personally want to go to Mars. It's just that, as I said, I think it's extremely important that uh, life become multiplanetary. And, and so you might say, well, why do I think it's important? Um, you know, aren't there lots of important things going on on Earth um, that should be should be addressed and, and certainly there are and it's not I don't mean that it's important to the exclusion of all, all other things just that it makes sense to spend a small amount of our resources on, on, on doing this um, and the reason it's important is if you go to the nature of importance itself how do you decide that anything is important um, well the lens of history is a good way to filter more versus less important things and as you zoom out further and further um, uh, you know the the really important stuff stays and the less important stuff goes away. And, and let's, now let's say you zoom out really far and look at the entire history of Earth or history of life itself. Um, what are the important, uh, what are the most important elements in, in the history of life itself? Forget about the parochial concerns of humanity. Um, what would any, any species, any intelligent species say, oh, those were really important items? Um, well, there's obviously single-celled life, uh, multicellular life, plants and animals. Uh, uh, the animals, you know, things going out of the ocean onto land, um, the uh, advent of mammals, uh, consciousness. Um, there's about it, maybe 10 or so big ones on, on that list. And uh, on that list will also fit uh, the extension of life to multiple planets for the first time. It would be at least as important uh, as life going from the oceans to land, and arguably more important because life could go gradually from the oceans to land, and you know, if it's got a little uncomfortable on the beach, you could hop back in the ocean. Um, but um, go, extending life to another planet uh, is a huge quantum leap. You have to go hundreds of millions of miles across extremely hostile environment uh, to a, a planet which is um, completely unlike anything you've evolved to live on. Um, and um, that's just really an extremely difficult problem. In fact, I think it's an impossible problem and without the advent of con consciousness. So consciousness is a necessary pre precursor uh, uh, for that. It's almost like part of a grand design. Do you, do you think there is some kind of destiny involved in this, or is it just physics? Well, I, do, I mean, do I think that there's some sort of um, master intelligence architecting all of this stuff? I think probably not, because then you have to say, where did the master intelligence come from? Um, so you have, it, it sort of begs the question of, you know, <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it's sort of, yeah. So um, I think really you can explain this with the fundamental laws of, of physics. Uh, you know, it's a um, complex phenomenon from simple elements. Tesla, let's see, uh, started from the, uh, with, with a, a lunch that I had with, with J.B. Straubel and Harold Rosen. Harold Rosen is, is somebody who's actually very famous in the space arena and also uh, in the electric car arena. So that actually was what ended up being the bridge from uh, rockets to, to electric cars. Um, although, I had, as I mentioned earlier, I had a long-standing interest in electric cars because that's what I originally came out to California to do grad studies in. Um, so uh, anyway, I had lunch with JB and, and Harold, and JB mentioned this company, AC Propulsion, which had this car called the T0, which was a, a kit car with lithium-ion batteries that uh, had a 0 to 60 under 4 seconds, 250 mile range. So I was like, yeah, wow, that, that sounds great. And that sounds about right, because um, if you go from nickel metal hydride to lithium ion, you, you about double the, the energy density. And um, the EV1, which was a nickel metal hydride car, had had about a 200, about 120 mile range. So if you double the energy density, you're going to get 240 mile range or thereabouts. So uh, I, I got a test drive of the T0. I said, wow, this is really great. I want to I, I try to encourage AC propulsion to go into production with the T0 um, or, or productize it essentially, um, but they weren't inclined to do that. They're sort of more of an um, inventor type shop. Um, they don't like to go, in, they don't like to make product. On, uh, so, um, and I tried to get them to even make one for me, and they wouldn't make one for me. Um, anyway, um, but they did end up uh, 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 introducing me to uh, three guys Martin Eberhard, Mark Topping, and uh, Ian Wright. Um, who, who were interested in productizing the T0. So I, I, fu I, I funded the company and worked with those three guys to develop the, the Tesla Roadster. 
um, and uh, um, the design ended up being an iteration between myself, pr primarily between myself, uh, J.B. Straubel, the guy I'd had, I'd had lunch with who, who, who joined Tesla right after I funded it, um, uh, and, uh, and Mark Nevelhart. Yeah, w with, with, the, with the Tesla Roadster, um, the sports car, it's a two-seater sports car, very high performance. It says super car performance. In fact, it'll beat any Ferrari or Aston Martin um, in acceleration. Um, and um, it has more than twice the energy efficiency of a Prius. The fully computed well-to-wheel -well efficiency, taking a gallon of oil and converting that to, uh, you know, burning that to generate electricity, taking transmission losses and charging losses into account, counting how many miles you get and taking that gallon of oil, refining it to gasoline and seeing how many miles you get. That's how you get the well-to-wheel -well efficiency. Um, and the, uh, the Roadster is more than twice as good as a, as a Prius. Um, but it's $100,000. And, uh, and the reason is because new technology takes time to optimize. We're working on Model 2, which is a um, luxury sports sedan, uh, four-door, five-passenger, uh, quite roomy, and uh, that'll go for about half the price. And, um, and then we've got additional products uh, in, in the queue, which will drop that price by half again. And, and get us to about a $30,000 car. With Solar City, um, the idea there is to solve the, to help solve the production side of electricity. So oh, it's all well and good if you've got electric cars, but how do you produce the electricity? So that's, that's why I, um, I wanted to do Solar City. Um, and there I have to give a lot of credit to uh, Lyndon Rive and Peter Rive, um, who are actually my cousins, <laughs> um, but they, they're the guys making it happen. Um, and although I contributed to the initial idea, that's really just a small part of the equation. Um, as Edison said, you know, it's 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Um, and uh, they've just done a phenomenal job on uh, uh, executing that company and making solar power affordable. Um, and, 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 and also, uh, it's innovation on so many levels because uh, there's, the, there's, the there's the installation and the construction of the solar power. Um, but but then you also have to say, well, how do you make it um, so that people don't have to outlay a, a bunch of money? Because solar power is very much a cost of capital type of business. Because once you've paid for it, there's no fuel. So it's really, how do you reduce the cost of capital uh, for buying the thing in the first place? And they've come up with some very innovative uh, financial tools. Um, working with uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, uh, they set up a $300 million fund that allows people to establish solar power with no money down. So, I mean, how do you like this proposition? You spend, you, you put no money down, and your electricity bill goes down. What's not to like? What's not to like, exactly. So they're growing like gangbusters. It's a little intense. Uh, actually, I'm trying to throw it all back, um, because particularly the triplets are um, starting to gain consciousness. They're, you know, almost two. And, um, uh, well, before kids gain consciousness, they don't really know if you're there or not. I mean, they know that people are there, they recognize familiar faces, but they don't, know, they're not, they don't have expectations that dad will be home at a certain time. The twins do, there are four. You have triplets and twins? Yeah, oh. all boys. Uh, so I, I definitely have to scale down my work activity um, within, I think I've got, a, a, you know, no more than a year. But do you spend, I mean, between these three big things going on now, is most of it here at SpaceX, or is it, I mean, where you, you're at your work day, where are you putting in most of the, the time, I guess? It, it does vary. Uh, so... I mean, right now I'm probably 60, 40, uh, or 60 percent SpaceX, 40 percent Tesla. Well, actually, probably uh, 60 percent SpaceX, 35 percent Tesla, and 5 percent Solar City, and everything else. So most of my time is really split primarily between SpaceX and Solar City. Um, I long term, I'd like to to be more like um, to to reduce the total number of hours worked and to be roughly 25 percent Solar City. Uh, sorry, sorry, 25 percent uh, Tesla, maybe. Uh, s s you know, uh, sixty. Change the ratio. Yeah, change the ratio to be a little more weighted in favor of SpaceX because I didn't. I wasn't expecting to spend so much time with Tesla, and um, and then also just to reduce the total number of hours so I have more time to spend with my kids. Tell me a little bit more about the philosophy, how you make that all work, how you attract the people, how you manage it. You talked about the first principles of physics. You actually apply uh, the principles of physics to your philosophical thinking of how to do this, or you take me into that realm. Hmm. Um, Well, so you have to say, well, what, is, what, is the, what does the phrase re reason from first principles mean in physics? It means that you go to the very basic laws of physics, the things to which we believe to be 
extremely well demonstrated. In other words, the reason they call it a law is that no one has ever demonstrated an exception to that, ever. Um, that, that's, that's how it qualifies as being a law. Um, but even then, laws can be broken where you can find some corner case in a very unusual circumstance um, that, that will break it. And that's, the, say, the transition from Newtonian to Einsteinian um, mechanics. Um, Newtonian mechanics are actually extremely predictive of reality, except as you approach the speed of light. Um, so, uh, and, and since, you know, back in the day, that with the primitive instruments, they couldn't detect these tiny little differences. So, um, you know, Newtonian mechanics appeared to predict everything perfectly. Um, but you, you take these very fundamental laws and you say, now let's use those as, as the ingredients uh, from which we will construct a, a, a conclusion, a, a, a theory, because we know that base is sound. And we, so therefore, if we're able to combine those elements in a way that's cogent, um, that conclusion will be sound. That's what I mean by reasoning from first, first principles. And I think that general approach can be taken in many fields. Because how do you translate that to getting the right people who think that way, to, to these breakthrough ways of thinking, these innovations that go on? Well, getting the right people is extremely important. Um, and I, I actually interview everyone at SpaceX personally. And we're a 500-person company, so that's a lot of interviews. Um, what do you look for in something? What do I look for? It depends on the, on the task. Uh, you know, it's different. I don't, I'm not necessarily looking for someone who who's, um, has brilliant analytical ability if their job is going to be uh, assembling... Um, Hardware, you know that, that you know. It, it, but I think generally I look for um, a positive attitude, and um, are the are they easy to work with? Are people going to like working with them? It's very important to like the people you work with. Otherwise, life, you know, your job is going to be quite miserable. Um, and in fact, we have a um, <clears throat> a strict no assholes policy at, at at SpaceX, and we fire people if they're. I mean, we give them a little bit of warning, but if they continue to be an asshole, then they're fired. Um, That's innovative, right? Yeah. Um, uh, because, although, you know, if, if, you're, if your boss is an awful person, you're going to hate coming to work. I think the United States is, is more open to new, new ideas than any country in the world. And, um, and, and I think it's, it somewhat becomes somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that because the United States is open to new ideas, it attracted people from around the world who had new ideas. And so it becomes, uh, <clears throat> you know, so now it's full of people who, who like new ideas. <laughs> Um, and uh, who, who aren't <clears throat> bound by the b bound by history. Um, you know, a lot of the the countries that have been around for a long time are really trapped in their own history. Um, and uh, the United States is also a, a great melting pot of different cultures and, and ideas and thoughts. And um, and it's it's a it's a country which tends to encourage success, uh, where you, you you sort of see someone that did extremely well, and generally the reaction in the United States is good for that that person. Um, in most countries, it may shock people in the United States. In most countries, that's not the reaction. Um, people tend to think, oh, that person did, did well because they, they screwed somebody else. Um, or they try to rise beyond their station. That, that was really inappropriate of them to be so nouveau riche, uh, to use a French word. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and so that, you know, and, and Australia, for example, which is arguably a similar uh, to the United States uh, in a lot of ways, but they they tend to not they tend to try to knock down people that have have risen risen too high. They call it the tall poppy syndrome. Um, you know, tall poppies get chopped. Uh, so I think that's really a good thing about the United States. Well, you have to look at the, what's the definition of an ordinary person. Um, I probably wasn't that ordinary, um, but my lack of ordinariness, ordinariness did not manifest itself until later in life, um, or well, wasn't all that obvious. Um, <coughs> But I think people can choose to be not ordinary. You know, they, they, uh, they can choose to not necessarily conform to the conventions that were taught to them by their parents. Um, so, yes, I think, I think it's possible for ordinary people to choose to be extraordinary. I think on like Wikipedia it says that I was inspired uh, by my father in terms of technology. This is, not the, this is actually not true. I think that needs to be corrected. <laughs> um, He's somewhat of a Luddite, actually, um, in, in many respects, and particularly computers. Uh, he didn't want to buy a computer and refused to use computers and said they would never amount to anything. 
Um, so I actually had to buy a computer, was saved up, you know, saved up my allowance, and um, and he, then he did contribute a bit after I saved up my allowance. But he initially refused to buy a computer for me. Um, but but he was an engineer, um, electrical and mechanical engineer. So I was exposed to technical uh, subjects when I was growing up. Um, it, it's just that he wasn't much of a technologist. Um, as far as role models, um, I think, you know, there's obviously some of the, the obvious role models. I think Edison was certainly a role model, um, pro probably one of the biggest role models. Um, Did you study Edison's <coughs> life? Or? Yeah, I read books about him, absolutely. Um, and, um, and it's an interesting contrast, like Edison versus Tesla, because interesting, you know, the, the car company is called Tesla. Um, and the reason it's called Tesla is because we use an AC induction motor, which is an architecture that Tesla developed. Um, and the guy probably deserves a little more play than he gets in current society. Um, but on balance, I'm a bigger fan of Edison than Tesla, um, because Edison brought his stuff to market and made those inventions accessible to the world, whereas Tesla did, didn't really do that. Um, so uh, that's so he'd, he'd certainly be a big one, um, and uh, you know I, thought, I think you know the, the, the great technologists, uh, you know Steve Jobs at Apple, um, Bill Gates, um, uh, I actually thought Disney was a pretty good innovator. Well, I try to make it a really fun place to work, really enjoyable, um, and. Um, I, uh, you know, talk about the, the grand, you know, the vision of uh, SpaceX, where we want to go, we want to do, we want to take people to, to orbit and beyond. We ultimately want to be the company that, that makes a difference in extension of life beyond Earth, um, which is one of the most important things that, that life itself could achieve. Um, and so, so you construct this, like, there's this, you know, great holy grail potential in the future. Um, you, you have to stay grounded in the short term, so, you know, because if you don't do things that pay the bills, you're not going to have, uh, you're not going to achieve the ultimate long-term objective. Um, but it's nice to have that sort of holy grail uh, long-term potential out there as inspiration for, for coming to work. So. Yeah, I mean, you're motivated <coughs> money, but, and you want to make money, but you're, are you motivated <coughs> beyond just a profit motive and racking up dollars? And yeah, no, I'm a volunteer. I mean, I don't need the money. Um, there's nothing, I, I mean, I, it's not like I'm sitting here saying, I wish I could buy such and such a thing. I could buy it. Um, I get paid minimum wage, actually. I don't even get overtime. Um, so, but not being motivated by, personally, by money is not the same as saying that I think SpaceX shouldn't make money. In fact, it's very important that SpaceX is profitable or we will not be able to earn the money necessary to continue future developments because the company's at a scale right now where I can't afford to just personally fund it and not get any, you know, and, and not if we don't generate any revenue. We have to sort of earn our keep because we're a pretty big company right now. Well, I think it's, it's, it's really a mindset. You have to decide we're going to try to do things uh, differently, well, provided that they're better. You shouldn't do things differently just because they're different. They need to be different and better. Um, but I think you just have to sort of decide. Let's let's think beyond the normal stuff and and, um, and and have an environment where that sort of thinking is encouraged and rewarded um, and where it's okay to fail as well because when you try new things you try this idea, that idea, <clears throat> well <clears throat> a large number of them are not going to work and that has to be okay if, 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 any, if, if every time somebody comes up with an idea that has to be successful you're not going to get people coming up with ideas well it's like the Nike slogan, you know, just do it uh, that's you know, um, you know, just showing up is half the battle. <laughs> just you know, you, you got to try hard to do it, and don't be afraid of failure. Um, but you also need to be rooted in reality. Um, so you shouldn't. It, it's easy to get high in your own supply, um, as uh, Scarface said. Um, you know, you you you've, you've got to not be afraid to innovate, but also don't delude yourself into thinking something's working when it's not. Um, or you're going to get fixated on a on a bad solution. Um, yeah, and I think also just just um, don't you know, don't be afraid of new arenas. Uh, you know, you can get a book, you can learn something, um, and and experiment with your hands, and you know just make it happen. Find a way or make a way to, to get something done. You know, there's a lot of things um, about Ford that are I think are really interesting. Um,
Yeah, he's often associated, obviously, with the the moving production line. That was a, a big a big innovation. Um, but you know, Ford is just the kind of guy that that just you know he he just you know when something was in the way, he just found a way around it. He, he just got it done. Um, he was also big on vertical integration, which I actually think is, is good. Um, that you know, in in, in modern world, uh, people have started to think that vertical integration is bad. I, I think Ford was was right that you you do want to be vertically integrated, not not to a silly degree, but you you do want to be vertically integrated. Um, you also also think it's good to combine uh, engineering and production, so have development and production close together, um, because uh, when you try to make something. Or, or to, uh, uh, it, it, there's a big leap between making that first prototype and actually making it, uh, manufacturing it in large quantity, with with uh, good quality. It's really hard to make that leap, and for some reason, people decide, oh, they're going to do the engineering here and do the, the do the manufacturing, you know, the other side of the world. And I think that that actually ends up being uh, often being pretty inefficient. Um, I, I like that combination of of engineering and production. Um, what else is there? You know, Ford, at least in the beginning of his career, I think he got a little. He, I think he, he got the a little too high in his own supply later in his career. Um, uh, or Ford would would have remained the largest car company in the world. Um, but at least in the beginning of his career, he actually was really focused on what the customer wanted, what what, what the customer needed. And sometimes the customer doesn't actually know what they they need. But he you know he he really figured out like if we can make this car. Really affordable, reliable, uh, something that somebody that the farmer can depend on their livelihood for. Um, man, that's really going to make a difference in people's lives. And and he just really got focused on that. Um, now over time, he should have decided. Okay, sometimes people want a color that's not black, um, and so you should provide that to them. Um, but you know, at least in the beginning of his career, he just had tremendous insight into what would really make a difference uh, as a product. I do. I do want to go to go to to, to space, um, and eventually it would be really cool if I could go to Mars. Um, that would be super awesome. Um, but I, this is not about me getting to space. It's really about enabling others to get to space. It's about enabling the, the extension of life beyond Earth. Um, so, I'd like to go in the first one. But I, I actually, if, if if I didn't have all these so much depending on me, I I, I would actually. Um, you know, early in life, I did lots of risky things when I didn't have that much that was depending on me. Um, now I have to be more cautious about risky things, um, but eventually I will definitely go up.